Um, I had one comment from a friend that said, you know, at the time I was working for KPMG, so, so one of the largest um, consultancies out there. And he made a comment, he said, you know, how have you got a really good job, but your hair looks like that? And I kind of wrestled with it for a second. I said, because I'm really good at my job. And he couldn't like reconcile the the notion that your appearance doesn't matter. And I think that's a very hard thing for, for black people to take because I think we have to, we, we've conditioned ourselves to believe that there's one way to be professional, that there's one look you have to have. And if you don't have that look, then you won't be taken seriously. What's up, everyone? My name is Walt, and I'm the host of Boss Locks. Now, if you're a day one listener, welcome back. And if you're a first time listener, thank you for joining us today. This is Boss Locks, a show where we are redefining professionalism, elevating black voices, and proving that natural hair and professionalism do coexist. And we do this by speaking to black leaders and CEOs, and just incredible people with really dope perspectives to learn about their personal and natural hair journey and their experiences working while black. Now, we have a special guest today, and I really can't wait to introduce him. We have Mac Alonge. Mac, how are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. Really appreciate it. How are you? Doing pretty good. Doing pretty yeah. good. You know, it's still like fresh in the morning for me, so I feel kind of rejuvenated. I have my coffee. I'm ready to go. No, um, I'm, I'm towards uh, the the end of the day, so a little yeah. bit less, less yeah. um, rejuvenated than you. Time to wind down. Now, um, you gave you a little hint there, but for those who don't know. Mag is the CEO of the Equal Group, which is a data-driven diversity and inclusion consultancy company based in England. That's right. You know, we're going across the water, aboard a foreign exchange, talking about all these things from someone from a whole different uh, culture and perspective. And I'm really excited to hear all about it. You know, their company, they perform um, these services and offer a tech platform to help companies identify bias within the workplace and the necessary actions to eliminate it. And you know, this I'm actually really looking forward to this interview. Of course, all my interviews are great, but this is um first time I'm speaking to someone like he was really like solving some real like hiring practices, the issues and all these things that could come up when it comes to discrimination bias and all of these things. So, you know, I've got a bunch of questions for you today, but to start it all off, um, I like to ask people like, what are the three things that most people don't know about you? Good question. Um, <clears throat> I guess you, you don't necessarily know what you don't know, so... Um, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Typically, um, people don't know that I'm, I'm, I was born in Liverpool. So, um, obviously, for those that don't know, Liverpool is kind of a region in the northwest of, of England. Um, my accent sounds like I'm from the southeast. So, I was born in Liverpool, spent a lot of my life in London, which is obviously the capital of England. And the second thing that people don't know is that I'm uh, from Nigeria. So my parents were born in Nigeria. Um, and the third thing that people generally don't know is that my background is in energy consultancy. Oh, no. Very cool. So, um, you know, what's interesting, the only thing I know about Liverpool is their soccer team, which it feels like <laughs> one of the main exports, like one of the top teams over there. But um what are some things that people may not know about the differences between like London and Liverpool? Yeah. Um, so I think the football team, obviously football is a lot better in, in London. Um, mm. Obviously my perspective or soccer where you're from. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, I guess people don't know that Liverpool is, it used to be a huge um, international port. Um, still, still got a port there now, um, but you know the background is very kind of multicultural. There used to be a lot of trade coming through Liverpool, um, hence the the demographic, the local population um, is very diverse. Um, one thing that people don't necessarily appreciate appreciate about people that are from Liverpool is the sense of humour. So, um, I guess I would say that they are amongst the funniest people in the country. Um, okay. Everybody in Liverpool has a sense of humour. That's just um, a given. And I think when you move into other areas within England, 
it's only it's only then that you appreciate that actually it's something that's very unique to Liverpool. That's interesting. I never I never thought about that. I wonder if it's kind of like so like in New York. New York is like the place where well all the New York comedians are like yeah New York is the place to find comedy. So I wonder if it's like kind of a similar thing going on there. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. Cool. So um, parents born in Nigeria. I think um, I think that's really interesting and i think about like um in america a lot of black people don't really have a direct tie to um their ancestry in africa so it's really cool you're like boom like right there first generation um so have you well one um do you get to go back to nigeria at all um not as much as i would like so i last went three years ago um, have been itching to, to go back ever since, um, but just haven't had the time with um, with the business. And obviously now that we're in lockdown, um, right. travel is, is firmly off the agenda. I feel you. Yeah. So um, kind of growing up in Liverpool, um, what was it like growing up Nigerian? Because I think that for a lot of people in America, there was, um, I've heard stories that a lot of people basically try to hide the fact that they were African, because there's a lot of uh, discrimination, not just amongst like from white people, but black people as well. So um, in your experience, like what was it like being a, um, was it Nigerian Eng English or? Yeah, yeah, British Nigerian, I guess. British Nigerian. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess growing up, I, I part grew up in Liverpool, part grew up in London. Um, so growing up in Liverpool, I don't remember too much, but I do remember kind of a, a issue of racism on the playground um, and I must have been maybe four or five years old mm. and you know somebody made an, uh, an observation about the colour of my skin and, and that's kind of the first insight that I had into to race and racism um, in terms of, of growing up I guess I spent most of my time growing up in London um, as you mentioned it wasn't it wasn't cool to be African back in those days I think a lot of that was due to the negative perception in the media so whenever you saw Africa on TV it was starving kids and flies on their face and um, humanitarian crisis um, and so that that made it difficult to, to kind of proudly be African I guess I'm blessed that my, my parents as, as you mentioned first generation so my parents were quite connected to Africa or Nigeria as well as the the African Nigerian community so we used to go to like um, hall parties, which were just kind of community, you know, community celebrations um, where there'd be African food, African music, everybody dressed in in African um, attire. Um, and I think it, it's something that you don't necessarily appreciate when you grow mm -hmm. up because you're, you're used to what you're used to. So you don't you don't see it as kind of weird or different or, or abnormal. Um, because it was kind of just part of our, our everyday life. Um, and it's only once I've got a little bit older, so so moving into secondary school or, or high school for you guys, um, that's when you start to notice the differences a little bit more. Um, and yeah, I guess it, it, it wasn't, as I said, it wasn't the, the coolest thing to, to be African, but it, it is what it is, you know, you, you are who you are. Um, and I guess as, as, I've, as I've grown older, I guess it's become more popular to, to be African um, with the, the rise of things like Afrobeats. And obviously we saw Black Panther um, mm -hmm. a couple of years ago and that's completely changed the rhetoric. And hopefully, because I think I still think there's, there's work to do in terms of changing that rhetoric to make sure that Africa is seen as, as what it is. You know, it's, it's a beautiful continent. Um, there are beautiful countries. It has its, its problems, but where it doesn't? And I think... It, it's probably more of a PR exercise that the you know the West is is very good at hiding the homeless and hiding the people that die from starvation and, and hiding all of these systemic issues that, that they have um, whilst at the same time promoting and glorifying the the lavish and the the you know the, the people that live in in a well-off way but similarly Africa has has billionaires it has millionaires you know people live quite comfortably for the most part um, but in terms of PR, that's not necessarily seen. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, I've had a 
several conversations on this show about people who've uh, traveled off to Africa and speaking about the just the beauty in general. Like one, like besides if you believe it's impoverished or not, like there's so many beautiful places in Africa. It's like amazing. I see pictures and videos. I'm like, yo, that that's Africa. Like, no, they didn't. They didn't show that back in the day. So, yeah, I'm, I'm loving all the. Um, the attention and love I'm seeing like in Ghana, the year of return, man. Oh, I wanted to go there so bad then. And um, just seeing like one, of course, Black Panther, then Beyonce's Black East King. And man, I'm just looking forward to everything else that's going to come from like a media standpoint. Cause, um, and I'm, I'm ready to book my trip. As soon as COVID clears up, I'm definitely, definitely <laughs> heading definitely. out there. I'll, I'll join you. Yeah. Yeah. So um, have you been anywhere else besides Nigeria? Yeah. So, um, I've, I've spent a lot of time in the Caribbean, so been to Barbados, Antigua, St. Lucia, Jamaica, um, various other places as well. I've, I've not yet been to the States uh, or Canada, so oh, it's definitely, okay. definitely on my list. Um, yeah, come down to Atlanta, that's a, one of the black yeah. meccas in the US. I've heard, I've heard, I've heard yeah. great things. Um, definitely looking forward to, to getting out there soon. Oh yeah, oh yeah, cool. So, um, when hmm. so kind of go back to kind of you growing up in um in liverpool in london um so i guess the you had a strong like uh presence of other nigerians in a nice community you had a place to really belong and you had the strong ties to the culture and everything but um did you ever kind of question your identity growing up Oh yeah, hundred um, percent. And I think the 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 weird thing is that although I had quite close connections to to my Nigerian side and my African side more more broadly, um, in school, so in pri primary school, um, so between the ages of four and eleven, um, we were quite a multicultural environment. Um, therefore, you had people from all different races, all different backgrounds, all different religions, and you didn't really need to, to hone in on kind of, you know, people's backgrounds or people, you just, you just took it for granted, you know, people are, are who they are. Um, but when I went to secondary school, high school, um, between the ages of kind of 11 and uh, 16 to 18, depending, um, that's when I really noticed that the difference. Um, we were kind of a handful of, of black people. Um, it was in a predominantly white area. Um, there were all kinds of racial tensions at the time as well because the, the area was kind of known for being a little bit racist mm. um so there are a lot of tensions um and that's when i really started to struggle with identity to, to a certain extent because when you are a minority um you're seen as as kind of the other and as as a young man growing up you know how do you reconcile that um there were all, all kinds of differences in terms of racism as well from, from teachers, from, from peers. And that, you know, as, as somebody that is, you know, 11, 12, 13 years old, how do you begin to grapple with racism? How do you begin to grapple with identity um, and who you're supposed to be as an individual? And although I had, you know, I'm, I'm blessed that my father's always been, been around um, I didn't necessarily, I couldn't necessarily say that I had strong, positive role models. Um, mm. I would say that, especially at the time, I think a lot of our, our role models or who we saw on TV came right. from the States. You know, it was, it was your Jay-Z's, your Nas, your, your, your Diddy's, your um, Tupac to a certain extent. And what that does to you psychologically is is kind of conditions you to believe that there's only one way of, of even living the lifestyle that, that's being portrayed or one way of, of being successful. You know, for every um, every rapper, there was drug dealers, there was those pimps. There was never an economist. There was never a, a politician. There was never, you know, a lawyer or a judge. You know, apart from, you know, Philip Banks and, and the Fresh Prince and, and what they did <laughs> around positive role models, there wasn't that... You know, that was the exception rather than the rule. And the rule was mm -hmm. more, um, you have to rap, you have to play sports, or you have to, to be a criminal. Um, and those are kind of the choices that were out there. And 
it's only when you start to, to dig a little bit deeper and to really try to reconcile with these things that you see the problematic and limiting um, stereotypes that are presented in the media. And similarly to what I was saying about the whole the whole African dynamic, you know, unless you see a balanced portrayal, um, you have little, to, very little to go on. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things I struggled with as uh, a youngster growing up. Man, thanks for sharing that. That's uh, very real. I know um, that's that's actually one of the reasons I started this was um, to really showcase more people. Um, doing a whole bunch of different things. Like I, as I continue to grow, I'm learning about all these different options that we have. And I think that's one of the biggest things that's missing is just the understanding of the different options that we have. Like, of course, access to those are super limited, but just the knowledge that other options exist. Cause um, yeah, for, I remember actually when I was lit, I haven't mentioned this before, but when I was lit, I never actually tried, but I was like, yeah, I'm gonna be a rapper. That's gonna happen. <laughs> That's going to happen, but no, I'm glad that I didn't even try to do that because I would not have worked. Like, if I if you ask me to freestyle, I'll sit there like, hmm, for like five minutes, like, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, just, <laughs> it's just not happening. It's just not happening. Yeah, sim similarly, I think, I think kind of everybody goes through that, that phase where you're, I'll say between 13 and 15, where you, you start yeah. kind of, you know, can I, can I do this? And you, you kind of, you might write a freestyle or you might write a rap and very quickly you understand whether you're going to make it or not. And All right. I, I was fortunate to know that straight away, I'll, I'm, I'm not going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, to this day, people ask, can you rap? I'll, I'll joke, be like, yeah, yeah, I got all these, but nah, no, <laughs> nothing. Please don't put me on the spot. <laughs> Man. So um, to... Don't do your third thing, and I think it's kind of cool transition. So, um, you said you um, have a background in the energy industry. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. how does that happen? Going from um, just a realization that, well, maybe looking back at this realization, but at the time you only saw so many options. But you went into the energy industry, which I feel as though it's not a typical option that someone is aware of. So, um, how did that transition take place? Good question. Um, so it was a complete accident, a complete, you know, I'd, I'd be lying if I if I sat here and said that it was part of my five year plan or part of my five year <laughs> plan, it wasn't. Um, so when I when I entered the, the work, um, the professional world, so around about 2008, um, is around the time of the financial crisis. And jobs were hard to come by. And I was just adamant that I didn't want to be unemployed. So I was, I was just, you know, sending out job applications, CVs, everything that I could to, to try and um, get my foot in the door. And I remember somebody called me and was like, oh, you know, how much do you know about the energy industry and, and would it be interesting to you? And I was like, yeah, I love the energy industry and yeah, it's something that I've always wanted to do. Didn't have a clue, just, just <laughs> wanted, wanted, wanted a job. Um, so long story short got into the sector i've always been interested in, in economics so i studied economics towards the the end of um secondary school or high school um studied it at a levels which is kind of the the um the exam before you go to university mm. um didn't take it on as a university subject but it was always something that i wanted to do um and then when i got into the energy sector I went on and th did a master's in, in economics. Um, and that was, it, it kind of slowly became a passion of mine. So, so I got into the energy sector, understood more about it. And the more I understood, the more I could reconcile my passion for economics with the passion for, for the energy sector. Um, so so kind of just went on that journey and it's something that grew grew over time. But I remember very clearly kind of in, in the early days understanding that unless uh, no, without actually having worked in the sector i would have no idea that this was even a viable job that you know that consultancy energy consultancy specifically was a thing regulation was a thing um and this whole kind of infrastructure that, that's hidden from the rest of the world um that you take for granted you know you, you switch on your light and the light comes on you see it at face value. 
um, without necessarily understanding that that requires infrastructure, it requires codes, it requires communication across different um, organisations within the, the industry. It requires, you know, pricing, it requires government intervention, regulation, that kind of thing. Um, and that really kind of opened my eyes up to, to the, the whole um, slogan, I guess, that if you can't see it, you can't be it. And the the need for, for people to really do more to, to understand, you know, what are the options that are available to, to them. And that's why I've got so much time and respect for, for what you're doing with your platform. No, I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Yeah, it's um, that's that's really cool. So um, to get as detailed, so what what is an energy consultant like? What are the things that you really do? Like, what are you responsible for? Yeah, so it's a good question. And and for me, so I worked in the sector for for ten years. Um, and it varied um a lot over that time. So I had the the privilege of being involved in um gas, electricity, water and metering, um, typically around regulation. So within the UK context, we have regulators that impose kind of a, a periodic um, regulatory change program. So they'll ask companies to submit business plans for the next seven years or eight years, depending. Um, and a regulator will have to look at what well, the, the company would have to look at what they're doing understand how that's likely to change over the next uh, seven or eight years. Um, and within that submit a plan to the, the regulator to say, we want to do X, Y, and Z. So we want to build this power station or we want to, want to invest in this, this network. Um, therefore we need this amount in terms of returns and the regulator will say, yes, you can. So, so yes, you can pass that on to the customer or no revise what you're trying to do. Um, and there's all these this kind of <clears throat> regulatory back and forth um, to understand what it is that you're trying to achieve, how you want to achieve it, um, and and what you need essentially to to do that um, in the most efficient way possible. Wow. Um, so so a lot of my role was to work with leadership teams, to work with uh, regulatory teams, to understand what they were doing individually, what needed to be done across sector. So. Um, if there's 10, 10 or so companies that may be impacted by a specific part of regulation, we'd have to all come around the table, agree how we're going to do that um, and ensure that the, the customer is, um, you know, is positively impacted by any change. Mm -hmm. So it's really like a, a high impact role. Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. So I'm assuming that most of the people that you ended up working with were white. Is that accurate? Oh, a hundred percent white. Is that, and it's, it's not kind of, um, it's, it's weird as well, because I always say that it wasn't just the, the whiteness of the space. It was very middle-aged, middle-class, male-dominated. So um, very quickly when I went into the, the industry, I understood that obviously I was different. Um, and the the racial difference was something that I was used to because during school I, I you know I went through school with quite a um, I guess quite, quite a white um, cohort in terms of my, my peers um, so I wasn't that taken aback by the the whiteness of the space um, what I was taken aback by was the the middle class lens. And, you know, I, I dealt with quote unquote middle class people within school, within my educational journey, but not to the extent that it was within the energy sector. So it's like um, just so much private school education that I wasn't used to. Um, and I'm not sure if you know about um, the university system here, but Ox Oxford and Cambridge is, is often promoted as the, the elite universities to go to. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the individuals around the table were Oxford and Cambridge graduates. Um, so it, things like that just, just add another layer of complexity with regards to the dynamics between somebody that didn't go to Oxford and Cambridge and somebody that wasn't private school educated and um, for all intents and purposes isn't middle class right. and is additionally black and the only black face in the room. And also I, I look younger as well. So 
I think people, I'd walk into a room and people would assume that um, I'm here for work experience or, or I'm here on a graduate program. To run some coffee errands or something. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so it'd be the equivalent of the uh, the Ivy League type of culture here, like yeah. our Harvard and Yale's and all that. Okay, interesting. So that's assuming there's a lot of cultural disconnects. Was um was there ever? Well, I'll phrase it this way. So one of the things I started um, is a group called Working While Black. And it's an organization to really bring black people together from across all different industries and just kind of share the um, experiences that we've had in the workplace. Because I think that we always hear about like the direct racism, but rarely ever like the subtle things that happen, the things that we may not even be able to call out as racism, but we just kind of feel in our gut like, man, something's mm -hmm. not right. And I think um, part of the reason why I created the group is because um, oftentimes we're by ourselves with these thoughts and feelings and sometimes we feel we don't feel validated, things it's all in our head. So I was kind of wondering um, if you can recall or feel like sharing anything that you may have experienced just to add some context. I think that we at least in America, we have very, you know, of course, we look at things from our own environment, but I'm sure there are things that are experienced in other places, other countries where we may not hear um, about as much. So um, were there any moments in your journey that kind of turned into some um, kind of just awful moments or just um, uncomfortable experiences? Yeah, there were there were a couple. Um, there's, there's more than a couple, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Um, so what, one, one that sticks out is when I, you know, entered the industry, I think I was within maybe the first month of, of joining this company and they sent us a group of kind of four, four new starters, sent us off on some training and the training was run by an ex-military, uh, middle-class older gentleman. And part of the training, we had to give a presentation. Um, so it's like a mock scenario, made up company, present a business case, etc. Um, we all did did a certain presentation, and then we had to grade each other. So we had to, you know, um, give it give a mark out of ten or something. Um, anyway, I, I, I won, so I came out top, and he said, you know, congratulations. Um, you came across as articulate, as, as confident. Um, it must be all the rapping and playing basketball that you do. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> Yo. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Uh, a, I don't rap. B, I never told you that I rapped. Um, I do play basketball, but hey, you know, one out of two. Um, <laughs> and it was something that, that stuck with me because um, at the time I didn't have the the vocabulary or perhaps confidence to call it out uh, and to say, you know, this, this is, this is racism. It, it's not as overt as being called a name, but it's still very race based. Um, and he then went on to, to make all kinds of other statements about um, my colleague who was, was Asian or in Indian specifically um, kept referring to to curry shops and and mm. um, things of that nature. So there, w there was kind of that lens with, with which he was viewing the world. Um, other things like I've been, I, I was at an event once and, you know, these kind of industry networking events, you, you kind of talk and you, you make contacts and stuff like that. And I think I went up to someone and I was like, hey, how's it going? My name's Mac. And, and he looked at me, looked me up and down and then just walked the other way. And I was like, Okay, cool. Um, I guess I guess I won't be making contact with you. Um, there's been other times when when people have asked me, you know, where are you from, and I say Liverpool. And they say, no, where are you really from? So okay, I'll, I'll, I grew up in London. No, no, where are you really from? So okay, so say what you mean. Like, what what is it you're trying to ask me? You're trying to ask me why I'm black, or you know, what 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 where does my my parentage or, or my lineage come from? Um, so yeah, all, all kinds of subtleties. And I think, um, some of the, the graver ones, I think, are in relation to progression and performance management and, and the way that you're, you're looked at and viewed when it comes down to performance and, and where I've never 
ever had any issues with performance. You know, I've, I've always been seemed seen to be competent and and seen as a high performer in my roles. That hasn't necessarily led to the opportunities that that my less competent or less accomplished peers have um, had access to. So that that for me is more significant than the the micro stuff, if that makes sense. I want to take a quick break to tell you about a group that is taking over these Zoom streets, and that is Urban Atlanta. Urban Atlanta is a networking group exclusive to black people that has made networking fun and easy to experience. You know, they started out as a local meetup, but since the pandemic, they've evolved into a global virtual meetup for black professionals to come together every first and third Thursday of the month. Urban Atlanta believes that when people meet, it provides them with the freedom to build a a framework for financial freedom, independence, and collaboration. And that last part, collaboration, is key. You know, one thing that I get asked about all the time, really, is how do I find these amazing guests to come onto the show? And the answer is networking. And one of the my one of my go to places to not only practice my networking but also find some incredible people is the Urban Atlanta community. For an example, episode twenty one with Alana Jamison, it wouldn't have happened if I didn't start going to the Urban Atlanta meetup. So if you're black and you want to meet some incredible people, go ahead and go to urbanatlanta.org. That is U R B A N A T L A N T A dot org. Or click the link in the description to register for the next free networking event. Hope to see you there. I think, um, well, in my personal experiences, I've had, of course, I think outside of workplaces, definitely more direct things, but in the workplace, it's always subtle and subconscious types of uh, reactions as well. Um, well, what I could tell subconscious from their perspective, but um, it's very interesting. I think um, in your perspective, do you think that people in your environment kind of are like on their tippy toes and like try to dance around the subject of race? and like the history of slavery and all of that? Oh yeah, completely. Um, I think race has always been like the forgotten dimension of, of um, you know, what we refer to here as equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, I think people are comfortable talking about gender. Um, I think part of that is because everybody has a mother, you know, um, whether biological or otherwise. Um, so therefore, they can they can relate more on a personal level with, with individuals of another another gender. Um, people are somewhat comfortable talking about disability. Um, people are somewhat comfortable talking about sexual orientation, but race is, is where kind of the the unknown is. Um, and I think in deep down in people's hearts, you know, they harbour a lot of stereotypes a lot of prejudice that they ha- have yet to challenge so um we talked a little bit earlier on about kind of media depiction so if you've always seen africa africa or africans in a negative light and you've always associated it with poverty you've always associated the imagery with um you know flyers and and um malnourished kids if you've never met an African person, <clears throat> what is there to, to challenge that rhetoric? What opportunity do you have to say, actually, no, it's not all Africans. It's some Africans that have been chosen to, to be represented in the media. And therefore, it becomes uncomfortable when you, when you bring that conversation to the workplace because, you know, subconsciously, you may never have challenged anything around, you know, whether black people are criminals, whether they're, they're rappers, whether they're, they're um, you know, athletes. And therefore, that still rings true. You know, and even if you see somebody, you know, as, as I've just alluded to in my experience with the, the training person, that his automatic assumption was that I was a rapper or a basketballer despite me being in a professional setting. So even mm-hmm. when presented with information and um, proof to 
the the contrary of what what you've been told or what you've viewed as being the truth you still have a hard time reconciling it because you've seen it so much in one one manifestation that just seeing it once isn't going to be enough to tip the scale of everything you've ever known so um there is a need for us to talk about race more often more frequently within the workplace um the difficulty is that it it can be uncomfortable for for white people um but i think you know it's unfortunate that that the whole george floyd thing has has led to this outcome but i think since george floyd people have been more willing to to wrestle with, with that yeah very true i think um one thing I'll never forget is when his daughter just kind of, there was a video floating around his daughter just kind of looking around like, wow, my daddy changed the world. And I think that's so accurate because um, like since then, whether it's authentic or not, people have actually consciously, physically, verbally acknowledged that there's a issue with race and um, well, not only America, but across the world. Like I think one thing that was interesting for me was um, seeing it was interesting one seeing a lot of white people kind of showing to support in America. Um, but then also just seeing everything from all around the world. And obviously it's the power of the internet plays into that. But one, you see people from all over um, showing one support for what's happening in America, but then also calling out things that are happening in their countries as well. And I know one thing that I've always been kind of curious about are the race relations in England. Cause from my perspective, of course, um, I think most of the English people I've met were white. I've been met several black people, but I've always just had this impression that it was kind of hidden and pushed back. Like slavery in America was like very in your face, even though people still do a great job of hiding. It's just like a very blunt in your face discrimination, all these things. But I haven't heard that many stories from um, um, just things in England and France and all these other places where slavery was prominent there too. So um it's really cool to start to hear voices come up, black voices come up and speak to kind of things on like a large global scale. So, um, in, um, yes, it's, yeah. it's, it's an interesting dynamic as well, because I think the, the UK has a very, uh, polished way of separating themselves from, from atrocities and, and violence and all kinds of things that happen on a geopolitical level you know, we can, we can go kind of as far back as, as slavery, um, or we can point to, to recent things, you know, where um, Iraq and Afghanistan and all of these things that the UK has played an uh, instrumental part in, but yet at the same time still manages to <clears throat> separate themselves and still manages to take this, this pseudo moral high ground, um, you know, going as far as sanctioning other countries and, and pushing for other countries to be san sanctioned for doing what is a logical thing. So, so a lot of people don't know how, how much arms and weaponry the UK has a hand in producing. Mm -hmm. And then would then, you know, sell those arms to, to people that have no right um, holding arms um, and then when they use those arms, say, "Oh no, 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 you can't do that. That's that's um, you know that's gen that's genocidal or that's um, that's wrong." You know, where did they get the, the arms from in the first place? And, and right, it's the same thing. Same thing with, with slavery. To say actually, a lot of the resources that we have in this country are a direct result of slavery, as in. The, the country houses that you see, the palaces, the the um, the large land estates, a lot of it is linked back to directly to, to wealth that was generated in plantations that were staffed and resourced by African labour. That directly, there's no there's no there's no middleman, there's no offshore bank accounts directly, like sugar plantations, um, money came directly to the UK. Um, and built up this wealth and built up these estates, built up companies that, that we have today and that the companies are pushed as the, you know, the, the pride of Britain and, and things like that that are positioned in such a reputable way without that link being made to say, actually, this is a direct legacy of slavery. And that's something that, that needs to be unpicked. Um, and there's 
um, a couple of great organizations at the moment that are doing that work to to highlight um, some of those issues. But as you said, it's, it's, it's kind of a, an underground um, phenomenon rather than um, people being open and, and owning it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. I'm really glad to have that kind of new perspective as well. Um, so with your company, the equal group, um, you kind of tackle some of these things like the racial biases, but, um, to go back a little bit, I, I'm just curious, like what was that took you, um, cause I know you worked as a diversity consultant, um, a while ago, but what, what led you to really making that decision to make that leap and saying, yeah, I'm starting the equal group. Yeah, really good question. Um, so I think within the energy sector, obviously, I observed that there was lack of diversity. Um, I was in the sector for 10 years and, and towards the end of that 10 years, started having more pointed conversations around diversity to say um, specifically to leaders, you know, do you see this as an issue in the same way that I see it as an issue? Um, and a lot of them said that they did see it as an issue. Um, and then the follow up question was, you know, what can we do about it? Um, how, how can we change this? And that's where there was a lack of comfort. I think people didn't, A, didn't know what to do, um, but B, didn't want to be seen to do or say the wrong thing. Um, <clears throat> and the UK culture were quite, um, I guess it's not just the UK culture. I think globally now with this whole social media generation, people are probably more hesitant to do the wrong thing for the fear of that negative backlash. You know, am I going to end up um, all over Twitter? Am I going to trend for for being racist or... The next Karen. Yeah, exactly. Exactly that. Um, So, again, there there was a a perception or mindset to say, let's just see how things go. And for me, the 10 years I spent in the sector was more, you know, let's just see how things go. Um, naively when I joined the sector I I thought that things would change over time things would get better it would become more diverse and there'd be more opportunities for people and what I actually saw was probably the opposite I saw um, things getting a little bit worse things getting more and more ingrained um, and then more kind of token registers so so just having a black person in the room to tick a box rather than identifying that that person was the right person for the job um, and giving them an opportunity based on their skill and aptitude. Um, And then part of it was reflecting on um, the, everything that I'd experienced in those 10 years and just saying, actually, there has to be a a better way of doing things. You know, if we can, if we can put people on the moon, why is it that we can't fix diversity and inclusion? So we set up the equal group with really a mandate to see what are the things that we need to do to make the most significant changes in relation to equality, diversity, and inclusion? And when I say significant, it's not about the the black squares or the charters or the pledges or the commitments. It's about what are the things that are going to make the most fundamental change to um, how everybody feels on a day-to-day basis, but then also how opportunities are disseminated across different different people of different backgrounds. Um, and one of the things that we found first and foremost was that there was a lack of data. So people weren't really tracking data, um, both qualitative and quantitative, I- in any meaningful way. And a lot of this stems from, I guess, my background within the energy sector and within um, economics to say, actually, if you are going to do anything, um, there has to be evidence to demonstrate the direction of travel. So in the same way, when we look at regulatory programs, we look at what's the current situation, um, what are we trying to achieve, and therefore rolling it backwards, how do we get to that place? Um, Using data to inform us every step of the way. So are we on target? Are we behind target? Are we ahead of target? Um, What are the things that that also need to be considered? So what are the externalities, the external factors that impact our ability to achieve certain things? Um, so really, the equal groups ethos is to take a data driven approach to equality, diversity, and inclusion. Um, what we saw, what we sensed from the rest of the market is that there's a, a bit of an intangible approach to equality, diversity, and inclusion. So mm-hmm. you do some training, you do some workshops, you make some people feel bad and then, then they go back to, to work and forget it all in, in a day or two. Um, that isn't necessarily 
an approach that is meaningful, an approach that is transformational or even sustainable. So for us, we're, we're really focused on what are the sustainable things that we can do? How do we change systems? How do we change processes? How do we change the infrastructure that either um, helps or hinders equality, diversity and inclusion? Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's so important because I think um, when you really look at the data, you can I see the kind of the direct um, result of like different like little things we may not even think about and i feel i feel let's say you're right like these uh well one the diversity trainings are important because they show you kind of the path and the experiences that other people have to face but it's like the what happens next it's kind of missing people really do go back to their own life they feel bad feel horrible feel like yeah i'm gonna change the world now and then a month goes by and it's like oh man yeah what what was that training i forgot and yeah so i think it's so important that what you're doing is really targeting the like the root cause because i know i went through a uh, program and they really talked about a lot of the things that we see are surface level but that surface level like you just if that's the only thing you're looking at and targeting you're always going to be there but if you really go down deeper to the surface the roots and see like what's happening in the soil like all that stuff that's when you really get to start solve the real issue at hand that's causing everything else like we see like just like with homelessness for example like the a lot of the solution is showing to feed food and bring food and that's important that's key but it's like these people are still homeless after they've eaten and yeah. that food only lasts for like a couple of hours so i think um, and, and, i love what you're yeah, doing yeah and it is about taking a, a multi-dimensional approach you know we would never say don't do training mm -hmm. training is important and, and it does increase and improve awareness but it has to be in addition to something else you know so, right. so using the, the homeless analogy there's nothing wrong with feeding homeless people but if that's all you do you've missed the point so it's about feeding them and then understanding systemically what needs to change to make sure that we're not just in this this vicious cycle whereby we just keep feeding people and keep feeding people where that then becomes inefficient because the money that you spend over a co the course of 10 years feeding somebody could be better used um, resolving the systemic issues that have led to them needing that intervention in the first place. That's right. So um, what are some things that you've noticed? Cause um, the, you, you guys have been in business for a good bit now. So uh, what, what are some things that you have noticed when you're like digging into the data of these companies? Yeah. So I think the, the discrepancy between groups is often a lot, um, a lot more significant than people would anticipate. So even questions around, you know, I feel like I belong at this organization, seeing what a, a white man thinks versus what a, a, a female black person thinks, um, seeing that just in real terms and the disparity between those two groups is, is, is eye opening to companies. Um, one of the other things that we've noticed is the impact of intersectionality. So looking at how do certain groups um, feel when there are multiple protected characteristics. So looking at females, looking at females from, from um, minority communities, looking at females from minority communities that also happen to be part of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, there's, there's kind of an infinite number of layers that you can dig down into um, and understanding how that shapes somebody's experience. So where equality, diversity and inclusion historically has been focused on gender. Um, once you start to peel back those layers, you understand actually how much more work there is to do. Um, but then also looking at things in the context of multi multiple dimensions. So not just looking at representation, not just looking at inclusion, but then also digging down into pay, remuneration, gaps in retention. So as a company, how often do people leave? based on their, their demographic characteristics um, and the way in which data can be used to, to inform what you do going forward. So being super specific in terms of what you're, what you're targeting. So is it kind of race-based? Is it disability? Is it sexual orientation? And what, are, what is your expectation in terms of the, the outcome of that intervention? Mm. You guys really can just find a lot just from asking a few questions. That's, yeah, that's exactly. pretty impactful. And, yeah, and I think the 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 
the good thing is that we we try and make it simple for, for companies. You know, we, we understand that actually there's a lot of a lot of work to do in this space. Um, but what we find is that a lot of companies focus their time and effort on identifying the issue. So you spend nine months trying to identify the issue and then you've only got three months or two months to, to resolve the issue. And then you <laughs> repeat the cycle again. Mm-hmm. And what we found is if we can shape that, um, to transform that to say actually spend a month or two on identifying the problem and then you've got this this nine months, 10 months to actually make the changes that then becomes more sustainable over the long term. Gotcha. So one thing I've noticed in the past two years when it comes to these big corporations, especially when they get in trouble for doing something, race and putting out some type of product is they go and hire a diversity um, officer, which I think is a, it's, it's one step forward, but um, I'm wondering, and not like a, which one's better type of thing, but what is the difference of someone hiring a diversity um, officer versus working with uh, your, the equal group? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. And I don't think it's either. Or. Um, we, a lot of kind of the, the day-to-day contacts that we have are equality, diversity, inclusion professionals, uh, whether that be a diversity lead, a diversity officer, manager, analyst, director. Um, what I would say to organizations is that if you are going to hire a, a diversity lead, um, it's about doing that in the right way. Um, and that kind of lends itself to providing budget for that person, um, allowing that person to, to truly have a voice. Um, what you find is that a lot of organizations hire these people and then under-resource them, disrespect them even by, by telling them the way that they want things rather than being informed by them. Um, and the analogy that I like to use is either in relation to finance or technology. You know, you don't hire a, a finance director and then tell them how to do your finances or you don't hire a, a, a technology director and then tell them everything they need to know about computers. Um, it's about being informed by them. And really that that necessitates a mindset switch. Um, I think a lot of people see diversity and inclusion as a little bit fluffy, um, a little bit less important than perhaps HR or perhaps um, technology or, or finance. and Really, it's about re- reframing that narrative to say diversity and inclusion could make or break your business. Um, and I think once people appreciate that, that will inform the way that they tackle the, the issue. So whether that's recruiting uh, um, an in-house person, whether that's liaising with a company, an organization like ours, um, again, there's, there's no right or wrong, wrong approach, um, but you have to do it in the right way. You have to be informed by specialists by experts it's not something that you should and and one of the things we also see is um you know people recruiting somebody very junior into into those positions so um somebody that's that's out of university with with two or three years experience going in as, as a as a diversity lead isn't necessarily helpful because that person may not have the expertise may not have that um that <clears throat> I guess that background in having consulted at senior level and really, you know, how, how do you tell your, your CEO that what he's doing is potentially racist, potentially homophobic, potentially problematic? If that's the first time that you've been in a board situation, if that's the first time that you're talking to, to a CEO, you're probably not going to have that vocabulary. You're probably not going to be able to articulate that in the way that it needs to be articulated. Um, <clears throat> and I guess one of the things that, I appreciate about external consultants is the fact that I can tell your CEO things that you probably can't um, in a way that you probably can't. And Mm -hmm. it's of no detriment to me. Whereas if you're in house and you have to tell your CEO that he's a bit of a racist, are you, you know, signing your exit papers? Are are you putting a target on your back? So there's, there's certain kind of nuances and technicalities that need to be, need to be worked out. Um, unfortunately, even during this, this COVID period, we've seen a lot of diversity and inclusion uh, individuals being made redundant or, or being um, earmarked as a surplus to requirements. And again, that's an indication of how important an organization sees that role. 
Man, I'm really glad you shared that because I think um, and that really just speaks to just being a black employee in general. Like there's, there's all these instances and you really have to decide like in a split second, like, are you just going to let it go or call it out and risk being the the angry black employee? And just because you really it's not just like at that moment thing, you got to be there the next day, the next day after that and forever so long. So it really could damage um your position in the company which it shouldn't be and i i personally would of course the first thought was just to lead the company but it's not always that simple of course so i think um that definitely speaks to having that outside company in who could just really pull up first day first minute be like yeah that's racist don't do that (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah, Yeah. and then that's that's exactly kind of the the conversations that we have you know i think um we've got no qualms about calling out problematic behavior we've got no qualms in holding leaders to account to say this is what you're saying this is what you're doing that's a problem stop it i want to take a quick break to tell you about a group that is taking over these zoom streets and that is urban atlanta Urban Atlanta is a networking group exclusive to black people that has made networking fun and easy to experience. You know, they started out as a local meetup, but since the pandemic, they've evolved into a global virtual meetup for black professionals to come together every first and third Thursday of the month. Urban Atlanta believes that when people meet, it provides them with the freedom to build a a framework for financial freedom, independence, and collaboration. And that last part, collaboration, is key. You know, one thing that I get asked about all the time really is how do i find these amazing guests to come onto the show and the answer is networking and one of the my one of my go-to places to not only practice my networking but also find some incredible people is the urban atlanta community for an example episode 21 with alana jameson it wouldn't have happened if i didn't start going to the urban atlanta meetup so if you're black and you want to meet some incredible people, go ahead and go to urbanatlanta.org. That is U R B A N A T L A N T A.org. Or click the link in the description to register for the next free networking event. Hope to see you there. I also want to transition now to your natural hair journey. So I think um, that's um, it's something that's very personal, but of course that that follows you wherever you go. That is you. Mm. So um, for one, how, how long have you had locks? Um, coming up to five years. Five years. Yeah, five years. Yeah, yeah. Nice. So, do you remember what inspired you to start your lock journey? It's it's a very good question. Um, I don't think there was like a one inspiration, um, if I'm honest. I do remember, I do remember being a kid actually when I was um, probably all through my childhood, um, and it was like late late eighties, early nineties, where afros are still a thing. So it was it was kind of customary to have an afro, um, and I remember just feeling pain every time. I used to take the afro pick and and kind of comb out the the afro um to the point that i, I didn't want to comb my hair you know I was, I was i was known as having a picky 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 little afro and you know if if you see pictures of me when i was a kid like i would just always have a picky uh, it'd be a mess um <laughs> but then i got to a stage in my career um towards the end of, of my time in the sector um when I started to challenge kind of some of the the presentations of, of black people within the sector, to be frank, in that there was always one professional mold of black person. So a, a mold for black men, a mold for black women. So for black black men, it was well groomed, well manicured, short back and sides, um, the same haircut, basically, the, the black professional haircut. Um, and any deviation from that was seen as, um, you know, risky or or unprofessional and same for women you know you have to have the weave um it has to be european texture um the makeup has to be a certain way and that was the mold for black women and i really started to question that and really really started to find that problematic because for white people there was no mold you know you can be scruffy you can have long hair you can have short hair you can 
wear suits, not wear suits. Like it just doesn't matter. Um, but then for black people, you have to have, you know, you have to fit into this one box. And if you don't fit fit in that box, you're not professional. Um, so, so firstly, that was problematic. At the time, I was a little bit bored with my hair. You know, I was sick of kind of getting it cut. Um, it's about to be winter, so I was like, okay, let me just grow it out. Um, I, I'm not sure if you remember, like back in the day, um, probably around the jar rule phase, like everybody started growing their hair and doing plaits and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And my, my older brother, my older brother is six years older than me, and he grew his hair. He got plaits. I think I tried to grow my hair around that time, and it just wouldn't grow. Like it got to maybe that that tool and just didn't grow. So when I started growing it, when I was in the professional world, my expectation was that it wouldn't grow anyway. So it would get to that long and it just wouldn't grow. Mm. And then it started to grow. Um, and um, the more it grew, the more I thought, okay, let me let me just try and do something with it. I think I started palm rolling it initially and small kind of locks started, started to form. Um, and then I, I, I guess subconsciously I started to think about the impact on my work to say actually if, if I continue to to grow the hair is there going to be um, a negative reaction from clients from team members um, as, as I said this is around kind of Christmas period as well so we were kind of in the office kind of not um, but then went back into into the workplace with um, my, my budding locks and my expectation was that people would say something and nobody said anything and that taught me a, a lot at the time actually not nobody said something so nobody in, in my workplace said anything <clears throat> however in the community a lot of people said a lot of things so so my mom didn't like it my dad didn't like it all our kind of family and friends didn't like it um i had one comment from a friend that said you know at the time i was working for um a, a, a kpmg so so one of the largest um, consultancies out there and he made a comment he said you know how have you got a really good job but your hair looks like that and i kind of wrestled with it for a second i said because i'm really good at my job and he couldn't like reconcile the the notion that your appearance doesn't matter and i think that's a very hard thing for for black people to take because i think we have to we've conditioned ourselves to believe that there's one way to be professional there's one look you have to have and if you don't have that look then you won't be taken seriously and it wasn't my experience you know i was taken seriously by people that knew me that knew that i could do the job and at the time when i started my lock journey um i was transitioning to another company and well, I was in the process of transitioning into another company. And I remember vividly questioning whether I should get a haircut before I go for this interview. And I reasoned with myself and said, actually, no, I, I, w- I would never be happy in that job knowing that I conformed or I changed myself to get that job. You know, so I walked into the interview and I was like, you will, you will either accept me or you won't accept me either way. I've won because I don't want to work for anybody. I don't want to work with anybody that doesn't accept me as I am. Hmm. And 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 that was it. And I think from from kind of that day and that that I guess that pivotal pivotal moment in terms of um, having that that courage or that moment of clarity to say I'm going to be me regardless. I, ha- I haven't looked back. I think that that's just always been my stance. Man, thank you for sharing that. I think um, that touches on a lot of different um, key points and kind of the struggle when it comes to people really, one, feeling comfortable with themselves in the workplace, but also in their own communities, that decision, like, would it be easier? Should I do this? Would I be better off? And that's all a very real thing. Um, we, we've given the people a lot today. Um, I think it was a really amazing opportunity to learn um, your experiences from a whole nother country and also what you've uh, created with the Equal Group. So um, one, um, can you share like where where can everyone find you in the Equal Group to learn more? Yeah, so uh, the website is www.theequalgroup.com. Um, on social media, we are at the Equal Group 
pretty much everywhere. So Instagram, Twitter, um, LinkedIn, um, or you can contact us via email at contact at the equal group.com. Nice. And is there anything else you wanted to touch on, share, dive deep into? Um, the, the floor is yours. No, just to, just to say, I, I really appreciate what you're doing. I think it's, it's amazing. Um, hopefully people will be inspired. Hopefully people will, will kind of tap into what you're doing as well. Um, and yeah, you know, th this is something that we need. Um, I just want money in the bank. Have no time for them. We just pray and say amen. We've been here, boys, since way back when. I just want money in the bank. Right, that is a wrap. Thank you for listening to the Boss Locks Podcast. If you like today's episode, make sure you're subscribed and following us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more. And don't forget to check out the links in, in our description to learn more about our guests, how you can support our show, you can leave us a voice message, and become a member of the Working Wall Black Facebook group. Thank you all for listening today, and we'll see you Tuesday for our next episode. Please don't stress me out I just wanna have some fun And a bank too much